very much for coming along today uh, to this launch event and webinar for Streets for All NI. Um, we're excited to uh, to bring this out into the world and we'll see how we get on with our, our kind of tentative steps into the world of webinars tonight. Uh, so really, just to say it's a good evening and, and welcome for me. And um, yeah, the, these are really our first proper steps into the public sphere for a campaign that we we hope can develop into something worthwhile in Northern Ireland. Um, my name is Jonathan Hobbs. Uh, I'm going to be your host for tonight. Um, I've been involved in, in active travel campaigning here in Northern Ireland for almost 10 years now. Um, it's starting to show. Um, and that was through working on first and foremost the Northern Ireland Greenways project and then publishing through the Bike Fast uh, Everyday Cycling website. Um, so for the event tonight, we, we have a number of great speakers lined up uh, and very glad and, and honoured to have them along uh, to help us out with, with this launch. Uh, we have uh, Julia Valone from, uh, she's a senior architect with uh, Cork County Council. Uh, we have Adam Tranter, who is CEO of Fusion Media and the Coventry Bicycle Mayor. And we also then have Damien Ochima, uh, who's the National Cycling Coordinator with Cyclist.ie and Antashka. Um, but we are starting tonight with the real reason that we're here, which is uh, the launch of, of Streets for All NI. Uh, and we have Agustina Martier here to give us an overview of really how we got here uh, and where we hope to go. Um, while Agustin is uh, speaking, I'm going to drop in as well, just a, a, a contact um, email uh, sign up so that you can find out more information going forward. Uh, we're going to be doing hopefully a lot more uh, sort of emailing out to try and capture people uh, who are interested in what we're doing, maybe putting out some email newsletters and things along the way, but also What's really important too is looking to try and coordinate action where we can to make uh, a difference when things come along, such as consultations uh, and all the rest. So, uh, Agustine is a, a senior lecturer in architecture at Queen's University Belfast, and she te teaches urban history and theory and architectural design. She leads the Street Space Project, uh, which is an international and interdisciplinary project uh, that studies everyday streets, shedding light on the way streets are used, experienced, and represented. Uh, she works with a series of NGOs and government departments advocating for equitable and just mobility and housing in Belfast. So Agustina, over to you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So you, it's great you already did all the introduction. Uh, it's, um, it's really exciting to be part of this campaign and I'm, I'm really happy to know that there's a lot of people signing up to this and hopefully we'll get uh, a lot more heads and hands in this campaign that has been uh, a really a, a bit of a serendipity, but also a load of people just having the exact same interests and pushing for better streets for everybody, uh, particularly in Belfast, but in the rest of Northern Ireland as well. So it's it's really uh, it's a, an honor to be able to launch this and talk a little bit about where where we come from and what we're doing. So I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, can you all see that? Full screen, is that okay? So uh, it's, it's really great to be part of this today and especially having Julia, Adam and Damien to join us uh, in talking about how, how can we make streets a little bit better? How can we, what, what can we do? How is it? Um, possible that some places are successful in doing this and others can follow through. So Streets for All started as a, I suppose, we got together about a year ago and uh, all with the same aims. And uh, I suppose the question is one of the main questions of a campaign that advocates for Streets for All is why now? And that's one of the first uh, things that came to all of our heads is obviously the, the fact that there is a climate breakdown and that we might not think about it enough on our daily lives, but it's something that will affect us and our children and their children. And uh, if we don't act now, and as we know by the many campaigns that are advocating for this, it'll be very hard to kind of solve the problems that we have ahead of us. Um, part of that climate breakdown obviously is caused by many other things like meat consumption or 
uh, airplane flying, but a good chunk of that, and we know this from statistics around the world, is caused by individual car use, particularly in cities, and especially when cars are idle for about 90, 95 to 98% of the time. They don't only uh, pollute and, uh, and um, make spaces more uncomfortable, but also um, they, they cause noise and they take space from many other things that we could be doing. Another reason has to do with the fact that mobility is also something that is very strongly conditioned and affected by uh, class division. And this is something that we have to take into account, not only in cases as extreme as Sao Paulo, which is this image, but also everywhere around the world where uh, divisions of class also have to do with divisions of mobility. And um, so again, why now? Uh, streets, Alan Jacobs said, are more than public utilities, more than the equivalent of water lines and sewers and electrical cables, more than linear physical spaces that permit people and goods to get from here to there. And that's, uh, that's some, a quote that has always stayed in my mind because it is about people who use them. There was a bit of a mistake in the 1950s and 60s thinking that the thing, the main reason for streets to be there was to carry cars from one place to another. And that's not necessarily the case. Uh, so we have a lot of different uh, statistics that have come out of different pieces of research throughout Europe and the world. For example, that uh, improving cycling, uh, people who cycle or walk make more trips to the high street, spending money in local businesses, 30% increase in retail sales, five times shop vacancy rates um, on streets with high levels of traffic. Uh, in terms of the cost of, of, um, of different ways of mobility to society, if walking costs you one pound, your society pays one P, whereas if you drive on your own, society pays 9.2 uh, pounds. So uh, for every pound spent on walking and cycling, the economy benefits by 13 pounds and motorway upgrades, bypasses, and the economy benefits uh, by 3.10 to 3.70. So there, there are all these kind of strong numbers that support the idea of uh, advocating for better, uh, more accessible and more inclusive streets that don't only prioritize the car. And why here? Why in Northern Ireland? And I mean, I, I talk about the case of Belfast because that's where I normally work, but uh, there was a huge change in the very tight, dense fabric of the city where the streets were constantly used for all of the ser services, all of the activities of people every, in the everyday. This is a picture of 1923, but it was practically how Belfast was until 1969. And uh, this drawing here on the right is the BDP plan of 1969, which basically as a map, it completely ignores the fact that there were things happening under that planned motorway and that there were people living in those places. So it's important when planning things and mapping things to understand that the things that you're drawing have an agency in what's going to happen in the future. And why here again? We have things like the York Street interchange that is still being planned and discussed, and we still haven't heard whether that's going to be completely scrapped, which is what actually should happen. Another one, uh, just a couple of days ago, the, the huge risk of losing one of the only two temporary cycle lanes that came through the COVID pandemic in Belfast on Dublin Road, which we know for a fact because we use it regularly, that it is very widely used, even though TransLink is saying that it isn't used enough and that it should go. So going back again to this, the significance of streets, and this is not just about learning from other places, but learning from the past in Northern Ireland, where streets were used for children to hang out and for, for people to just talk to each other and have uh, a kind of pleasant, uh, despite all the problems, uh, pleasant social life on them. Why here? Because places like uh, the, where the fish is in, in, in the waterfront in Belfast constantly get cars parked on top of not only the cycle lane, but the footpath. 
So this is not just a campaign about cycling. This is a campaign about more inclusive spaces for everybody, including children and elderly and people who like to walk and people who prefer to walk and people who would actually don't think of walking, but might like walking if they tried it and if the infrastructure was there for them to do so. So uh, very quickly, the last bit is, has to do with policy. The Belfast Agenda and Local Development Plan make, make it very clear that we should have investment in active travel. And that still hasn't happened as a fact. The local evidence shows that 12% of Belfast residents cycle at least once a week, 31% don't cycle but would like to, 77% think that more cycle tracks along roads physically separated from traffic and pedestrians would be useful to help them cycle more, 60% agree that more cycling would make Belfast a better place to live and work. Currently only two miles of cycle tracks along roads and there are safety concerns that stop cycling being a genuine travel choice. Another data uh, collected from my students a couple of years ago is that Belfast has one of the cheapest parking in Europe. There's more local evidence in terms of the promised investment. Uh, the walking and cycling champion has only one day a week for taking care of cycling and, uh, and walking in Northern Ireland. Uh, the, the new 21 train carriages that have no cycling storage, the Euro Street interchange is still there and the 40 million pounds committed to active travel for the next five years, we don't really know how those will be spent and on what. So just who we are, we're a series of people belonging to different organizations, such as Cycling UK, CSEN, Cyclist IE, Queen's University Belfast, Street Space Cycle, and NI Greenways. We were, uh, we, we did the challenge my department, uh, campaign in May, which got uh, a group of people contacting us to see how to move forward. And then the idea is what next? What can we do? I mean, probably we're not going to aim for this type of infrastructure, which is happening today in the Netherlands, who has been fighting for inclusive travel options for at least 40 years. Um, we do aim to try to understand these pieces of infrastructure more inclusively, try to get children involved in it. It's not only about cycling, it's about spaces for people to have conversations, spaces for people to be able to talk to each other without the noise of cars, and for children to be able to cycle happily and freely. Uh, I was in the Netherlands lately, and it was such a pleasure to just be able to cycle without fearing for your life. And then again, it's, it's a space for everybody. A street can be a space for everybody. This is a, an image of Barcelona, um, the super blocks that have allowed all kinds of things to happen in the streets. So I hope that this has illustrated a little bit of who we are as a campaign. And um, I'm really looking forward to hear from Julia, Damien and Adam. Thank you very much. That's great, Agustina. Thank you. Um, and I think, yeah, the wholeheartedly agree with with um, that. And I and I think that it's 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 really important. I think as the conversations have happened over the last year, um, that uh, there has been an environment in Northern Ireland where we have single campaigners doing things. We have small groups doing things in, in very particular areas. And those conversations that we've had that a lot of us are coming from different places. Um, myself, everyday cycling advocate, um, Greenways advocate. But when you work on these things for long enough, um, I, I think there's an understanding that everything that we do um, works towards livability. You know, it's almost like there, there, there's a there's a common thread there. Um, whether it's and, and I think it's it's about at this stage for us anyway, um, advocating for uh, and being an ally of um, all of those different elements of walking, wheeling, uh, cycling, and livability, uh, and and the success of whatever comes out of this will be about how many people we can draw in what skills that we can draw in from other people to to make what we're going to do um that much more powerful so thank you very much for for giving us that overview um so i mean we're going to move on to our guest speakers um for the evening and i would encourage you anybody who's who's in the webinar uh, if you have any questions that you'd like uh, if we have time at the end of each speaker's uh, segment uh, we'll see if we can get a question or two in um connor's putting that up in in the chat at the moment uh, there's a couple of ways you can do it 
Q and A feature, or just post in with with Q as the preference uh, preface in there. So, um, Julia Valoni is uh, our our next speaker for the evening. Um, so she's a, an award winning architect and urban designer with Cork County Council. Um, her focus is excellence in design of public works uh, and townscape through a people centred design approach, uh, generating civic stewardship and placemaking. Her work with Cork County Council has won several design awards, in particular the Clonakilty 400 Master Plan, uh, Phase 1 to 2, winner of the RIAI Public Choice Award in 2014, the Academy of Urbanism Award, the Irish Design Award, and RIAI best place in Ireland in 2017 and the latter triennial European WO prize in 2018. So Julia, I'll hand over to you. Thank, thanks, Jonathan. Sorry for all the, the long uh, presentation uh, introduction, but um, great to be here tonight and um, um, very interesting your, um, your group and um, advocate of, um, I guess, um, re-inhabiting the space, uh, this very important space between the buildings. We are all in the same page, I guess. My um, input tonight is gonna, um, I'm gonna show you what is happening in, um, in our town scale dimension here in County Cork and in Ireland in general. <clears throat> and from a street point of view, um, I would like, as Agustina mentioned, to to make sure that uh, streets are, are still part of a bigger context, which is, in my case, towns. And of course, um, it's important that uh, we, we actually at tackle this from any point of view, not only the actual uh, floor of the street, which has been always uh, sometimes uh, an issue. So um, I introduce you to uh, a lovely little street in Clonakilt in West Cork from 19th century. And uh, and it is a typical streetscape. I guess this would be also applicable the north of Ireland uh, street and um, urban town scale and um, what it was before and what it has been now transformed after the advent and of course i'm i'm not from ireland so i can also relate to my experience being italian being from sicily i like to, to show that um sicily being a much smaller country than ireland we still have um same number of uh, population and uh, and you wonder how is it possible but of course uh, when you look around you immediately see the difference and um, this is a typical town in Sicily and towns uh, still remain beautiful object in the landscape um, like Irish towns were but what happened in Ireland is that unfortunately we have a little bit changed the, the dimension of how we design and uh, develop our towns and of course this is important to, to get the context of how and what uh, people will inhabit in the street and and how can we improve um, the diversity the inclusiveness and and that very challenge of having people living in the street after all but this is um irish irish law in terms of planning and um it's disgraceful she says how close they build these houses and, and it's funny because i know agustina is laughing as well like we we come from a kind of much dense obviously um urban setting um in, in the rest of, of the world and this is a, a typical street in Sicily and of course uh, there were reasons why the streets uh, in Arab town like my town were designed with narrow uh, roads it was perhaps for the for the for the shadow obviously uh, but that gives us some benefit and, and these are the benefits because you can count on um, a resilience or you can count on, on, a, on a community feel a neighborhood and these are our streets and of course um covid arrived and and of course this is a fantastic opportunity to to learn and how streets can be a, um, a, a very important uh, asset for community and and everybody remembers those scenes from italy where um we had this um asset of being all close together and being helpful all together. So uh, I guess my line is always to challenge is the back back to the future because 19th century photographs of Irish towns are, are actually the same of Italy. And of course, these are a few of the buzzwords after COVID, but my agenda still remains reclaiming the streets from roads. And of course, a livable street um, is, is about the urban design, it's about the multidisciplinary team work. And uh, we in Cork County Council have got a, a, fun, a good base of working together, engineer. I'm 
in the engineer department, for example, we have ecologists, we have uh, uh, architects, urban designers, landscapers. So it's important, it's, it's, it's very much the time now to go and get together. And this is how I always seen the street and, and the public space is really the living room, is where really we need to be together and, and be in community. So that's how uh, I, I kind of as well include always young Gail um, in, in this conversation because he has done, spent all his life. Of course, he's learned from his wife being a sociologist. And this is still a, something very missing in the planning system in Irish law where, you know, we're still counting cars only. So the paradigm uh, can be changed and uh, I'm going to show you some of case study where um, the DEMOS, the Design Manual for Urban Roads and Street, is something that um, was very strategic. It came along in Ireland in 2013. We used to actually use the, the design manual for roads from UK, but this came along and um, unfortunately it's, it's, it's been almost 10 years now, but still it's a, a challenge for engineers to kind of get it because it's, it's very different. It, it completely um, uh, changed the, the view and, 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 the, and the emphasis on how we design streets. So, of course, um, you mentioned active travel. Uh, we are benefiting after, uh, after all and after COVID COVID, uh, immense fund funding. Um, it's incredible, the, the National Transport Authority. But again, and uh, how do we do make sure that we spend them correct? So I'm, I'm very happy to be talking about the DEMOS because um, it's still never um, um, late and, and never easy to, to, to understand it is about making the place function rather than the transport function. And we sometimes between architects and urban designer, we cannot get this very easily. But I've been working with uh, road engineers for so many years. And, and this is a, a, um, a quite a big challenge. So just to give you some um, examples, we are narrowing the road to the very minimum. And we are making sure that there's no traffic light, no road marking, there is nothing physical that actually makes you um, going slow, but as the geometry of the road that is designed to physically not going faster. This is uh, another, um, uh, this was included in the addendum of the DEMOS in 2019, is the quality audit, which is fantastic because, again, we used to always base our analysis on road design into the um, uh, road safety audit, and that was it. It was all about the car, but the, the, the quality audit uh, makes the road safety audit only one component of what is important is about the users and the place. And this, I think, is um, it's a stunning. It's, it's an important uh, point that um, I have used already in two of my projects and, and makes, again, that holistic approach and how we address. Of course, all of you are um, familiar with the healthy street indicators and uh, full Island in Ireland uh, as a tourist, tourism board has taken all of this on, 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 online. And again, we have funding not only from the NTA, but also from Fault Island, as about place making, and of course, um, it, 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 it's hard to design a space that will not attract people. But it's remarkable how often this has been accomplished. Again, back to my planners. Uh, this is a street in uh, in Cork, uh, well designed in terms of materials, expensive, but because the facade is not active, it's the back of a building is dead. And this wasn't about COVID. This was before COVID. Uh, building the resilience and reclaiming the stage and the street, and do it with people. It's what I am going to show you very quickly. And these are some uh, of uh, slides showing how important it is to work together. And uh, I actually can say that my own town in Sicily um, already is based on the 15 minutes walk. And we do have cars, we have public space, they all interact together. But there is a priority of people that comes first, and especially the heritage of the town. So we use the space in a very multifunctional way, like in the 19th century in Ireland. And we have carnivals in the street. But in Ireland, unfortunately, there is a big change and there is a big uh, diversion of function. And we have unfortunately transformed our main street only in car parking or retail and nothing else. And we have unfortunately after five o'clock all dark and our streets are dying. What happened to our public realm? This is one of the first traffic lights in London, everybody was celebrating, but that's how we transformed our town. This is some kind of audit I do in the towns of County Cork, Kinsale, the public clutter. Um, how do we think this is actually a street for all? And how do we think that you can bring somebody to look at this um, during Christmas or would you sit here? 
so a chain chain benches you have seen it all and this is my street uh, that i show in my cover from 19th century slightly changed and when i i arrived to ireland i said well, well why do you have all of this colored uh, carriageway and those um, uh, road marking etc and the answer was uh, to, to calm the traffic. So I always say in, in Sicily, we use octogenarius and ice cream stands to calm the traffic. And again, back to that sort of um, coexisting and multifunctional road. This is a bakery that operates in two premises and there is a road in between. In Ireland, this would not be possible. However, I have my octogenarius in the city center and they are also working as traffic calming because you have to go slow. So Clonic LT400, um, it was a 10 years master plan. So uh, we only finished the phase three uh, only this year. And I'll show you what happened uh, because it was only a funding for a square, but it's about that big vision and working together. And it's about becoming uh, sure that we have an urban design plan. So um, unfortunately, the day before we signed the contract for the two squares that were the first phase, the, the flooding came. Um, just was um, really a month before the contract. It was a big crisis. What do we do? Um, but we did go ahead because it was leadership and we wanted to make sure that we, we had to, to transform the town in terms of public crime and community. So that kind of case um, study of Asna Square before and after. So it's about get rid of the cars and start to build up the community that was there before and, and the shops that come together. The, uh, all the shops were closed before when there was all car parking and the community take place. And this is the street users. Like in my Sicilian slides, there is a lot of activity on the street and place making. And, and Emmett Square very quickly was another square that there, there was antisocial behavior in the center of the town, of this park. And what do we do? We just open a different entrance and we widen up the design lines of pedestrian. And that's what happened. And we put a little bit of ingredients of placemaking, like sculptures and um, water features, grass mound, working with the people, they take ownership and they maintain for free and of course a little bit of kiss chairs uh, don't 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 make go bad because you these are my cousins i asked them can you kiss please you're sitting in the kissing chairs and but it worked because actually uh, other people were in in a way embracing we need l to be close and 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 build up our community community that we don't didn't have any any money for the streetscape but guess what a drainage scheme came for funding came because of the flood we had the plan done so we were able to implement the streetscape and we didn't have any money so this was only um, a small percent percentage to add and, and what you need to do this excavation and of course the demos is applied here and you can see how my loved uh, yellow marking line can become beautiful and we were able to not to have any road marking in the street no road signs signage uh, we don't have any traffic light in clonic guilty so that's the before you can see how the traffic is dominated and this is my kissing chairs uh, uh, the after and my elderly uh, oct they're not octogenarius but <laughs> they're, they're, they look happy so that's the before and after and malo very quickly there's a, a, a big, um, in orange is the, um, the building empty. Why are they empty? Because there's a motorway. And what is the street that we actually have as a motorway during the week? What happened the weekend in this big road? And what happened when we give permission to out of center retail? That's where the people go. And that's important in the conversation. And that's Malo, a beautiful town before and after uh, the advent of the car and how we solved it. So. This is another case study where um, we didn't have money. It was the, the transport authority that had to do a road, Kila. But Kila is actually a, a little village. And that's how the planning was. This was the planning of the engineers. And this how many road signage it was in this village. So I was asked to, to bring um, a, a design concept and I based my design on urban design and the heritage of the place. And um, I suggested rather than having all this road marking, applying the demos for the first time in a national road, we selected five landmarks in the town and, and add a graphic designer to make the new signage. So the new signage now is this rather than all the road and speed limit. And what happened there? We worked with the community. You can see there. Um, um, there's kissing chairs in Kila. 
this guy were there. I said, can you kiss? Unfortunately, he transpired he was the local priest. We couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't get that kiss. And of course, again, who are the users of the street? And this is a motorway. This is a classified as a national road, but that there you go. And there's a sense of place and community. Again, uh, we in Colonna Kilti, this is the phase three of the project. We didn't have money. We had the design. The OPW came for the relief, relief wall, flood relief wall, and we worked together. So we had negotiated um, lighting, uh, a new footpath, trees, and very nice slick finishes. And that worked. So we were able to address also through um, engineering infrastructure funding. When we don't have money, we have learned this from COVID. This was actually before the COVID uh, and the parklet concept. This was a free parking day in uh, four towns of uh, County Cork. And we did that. This was beautiful success. And uh, we'd repeat it for a bank holiday in Fermoy and, and see what uh, a thousand people footfall uh, replaced for uh, eight car parking. So to finish, of course, when we do all uh, all of this and we spend our money and we do it with people and we, we are inclusive, that's what happened. This was the carnival that the community put on in the reopening of the streetscape and it was incredible. It was, um, they closed the traffic and they do it every year now. One line of tables the first year, the second year, two tables lines and the third year was three lines of tables. So we we like to say we, we designed the road in Clonakilty to fit tables number not cars and of course the the addition to, um include inclusive uh, the, the space becomes it becomes open to everybody is free this is the the refugee camp and very near to the town center become um, together with the town community a community that was inspired to become the first time in ireland to do a community a bike scheme a tricycle scheme that they imported from copenhagen where the the elderly people are taken from the hospice and brought around by volunteers and that and of course those community events like culture night together with the community and made the first autism friendly town in, in, in Ireland. And, and that's uh, my last slide now uh, to mention um, Shakespeare, all the world is a stage. And yes, the, 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 the street is a stage to linger longer. And as young girl said, a good street, he says city, but I say a good street is like a good party. People stay longer because they enjoy themselves. Thank you. That's brilliant, Julia. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I think the thread that I'm seeing through a lot of this is just an incredible amount of work for a start. Um, and a lot of those slides just show joy, you know, that, that, that you're creating space for joy in, in towns and villages. And um, um, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, I think uh, we, we, we had a couple of questions coming in there um, from some of our, our uh, audience and uh, a lot of it to do, I think, probably linking back to people in Northern Ireland and their experience of towns and villages too. Um, for example, in Clonakilty, about you know where did all the cars go, or or was there a good sense of where the cars were were coming from, where they displaced, um, and 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 how how you know how how that how that aspect of it is. Yeah, Jonathan, this is a very um, uh, question, a very common question. Um, where are the cars going? Every town in Ireland has got car parking. They are perhaps at the periphery of the town. Very often, they're not even legible enough. You see a P all, all together, and then you follow the P. You, you, you might be lucky and find the P. But there are parking spaces and car parking, and they're often not uh, identified or not enhanced enough or not connected safely and attractively. So what we do and what we did in Clona Guilty was to make sure that those car parking were enhanced and legible and, and then make sure that the connection from the town centre is also safe and attractive because we cannot get rid of car parking. We just relocate it a little bit and that is also in terms of providing still the, the possible car parking for the vulnerable users, of course, and for the delivery. But uh, it's, it's not bad if somebody walks a little bit more uh, to, to park their car, especially when they are employees. Uh, as we know, uh, a lot of cases, the, the shop um, employees might park their car in front of the shop, which is not great. <laughs> It does happen sometimes, um, and and thanks to to Chris and, and Jade and Stephen for, for these questions. And I guess the last question I would ask is, 
um, kind of from Chris and, and from Jade there is, I think that, that a lot of people are worried or find that there is resistance um, coming from maybe business quarters, from local traders to do with maybe loss of parking or loss of amenity, loss of access, that sort of thing and the community as well. So, I mean, how important is that process of consultation in terms of keeping the community on board, keeping traders on board? And, um, you know, some of the examples that, that people are kind of saying about Moira and Hillsborough in, in Belfast, beautiful towns, but dominated by car parking. Um, you know, you, you might want to take a picture of a, of a historic town with beautiful architecture, yeah. but all you see is just metal all the way along. And um, so so how, how important is that, that, that process of consultation to bring yeah. people along with you yeah that is absolutely crucial um i always uh, start it's, it's now kind of guilty for hundred is is like um a standard template now uh, you you have to start to working with the chamber of commerce which become in my experience my allies uh, very often the tidy towns and the heritage groups and it's all about making sure that they they design we design together and they are involved since the beginning of the early design stage and then it's that sense of pride they become so aware of how how much the the value is in their town center where you don't want to have cars and you you as you said you want to take a father of and in fact that's an audit process i usually use with them i actually show the audit that i do the photographic audit and sometimes um maybe an architect can have uh, visual tools as as to convince people because you show their own town that they've seen all the time but you show them in a different way and then it, it's very important as well is i am learning from them in terms of the knowledge of the town and and that heritage not only tangible but also the cultural heritage, which is very important in those processes. That's great. Well, Julia, thank you so much um, for your for your segment tonight. It's been really informative, um, and 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 I suppose even to to relate it back a little bit to where I live in, in Belfast, and, and you'll see from the, the the background behind me, we we have um, a great example in Belfast of CS Lewis Square as part of the the Conswater Community Greenway um, in East Belfast, which opened up this new uh, wonderful public space and has, has really become a community hub out of nowhere. And it's one of those things that that I say through the Greenways um, campaigning is. I'd love to have this replicated in certain ways in lots of different towns and villages across Northern Ireland, you know, and, and but I think that your presentation really shows the power of, 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 of that sort of work. So thank you. Thank you so much. So um, we, we're, we're going to move on now to our next speaker for the evening, um, and that is uh, Adam Tranter. Um, Adam is the CEO of communications agency Fusion Media. Uh, specialising in marketing communications around cycling and active travel. Um, he also co-hosts the Streets Ahead uh, podcast on active travel and livable streets. Um, Adam also volunteers as the bicycle mayor for Coventry, um, which is something that I think that may be of interest in general in Northern Ireland, that's something that could be really an interesting development. Um, he, through that, helps to coordinate between existing cyclists, the community, government and non-profits to make cycling better in Coventry. Um, and he was the first bicycle mayor in a UK city. Um, and that programme was, was founded in Amsterdam, where it's supported by the city government. So, Adam, over to you. Thank you. No, thank you for having me. And um, yeah, I feel honoured to, to, to be part of uh, this exciting time when you're um, starting a, a, a new campaign group, which is, um, which is brilliant. So, um, contrary to what I said just before we started, I am going to um, present a few slides. Um, so I will do that. Um, I will do that now. Um, let's do that. Go. Righty ho. So um, just a little bit about me uh, very quickly. Um, I'm a, a sort of lifelong cyclist, if you like. Um, I, I kind of came into this from being interested in the sport of cycling. Um, but when I had children, I mellowed out and, and realised that there was there was way more to to to, to life and, and and really just started to see some of the um uh, unfair things that that happened in our society that meant that my children couldn't ride to school or i couldn't even ride to school with my my children um my day job is that uh, i run a communications agency called fusion media as part of that um we look after brands like uh, brompton and specialized and rally and shimano um but we um also set up a campaign called bike is best which is funded by the cycling industry to try and show uh, everyday cycling is a normal and joyous thing to do that, that benefits um, society and tries to build on some of the uh, in increases in cycling we've seen 
since the uh, first lockdown. Um, I try and adapt some of these skills uh, for my day job into uh, cycle campaigning, um, so which I, which I think benefits a lot from kind of uh, a business-like approach sometimes, um, and also um, through good communication skills. So I, I'm working as a bicycle mayor in Coventry, uh, the city that I was born in. Um, Coventry, if you didn't know, um, actually was the heart of the world's bicycle industry um, at one point. Um, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, um, we uh, the, practically invented the modern bicycle, the safety bicycle that's known now. Um, but that, that, that bicycle was um, made by a guy called John Kemp Starley, who then, um, uh, it was called the Rover Safety Bicycle. And if you know much about cars, you'll have heard of Rover cars and therefore Jaguar Land Rover. So that was the journey that Coventry went on. It made bikes and then it made cars. Um, and we're sort of just trying to find our way again. Um, now, um, you'd be totally justified in thinking what the hell is a bicycle mayor, um, and uh, ultimately um, it's from an organisation called Bikes, B-Y-C-S, it's just a social enterprise in Amsterdam. They saw what was happening in Amsterdam um, from another scheme, a similar scheme, needs a better name in English, but they were called Nightmares, um, and they were people to look after the nighttime economy. Um, and they were they were independent. They were volunteers. They were they were sort of appointed by the community to to fight for the rights of the the nighttime economy. And um, they were quite successful. So the organisation that I represent, Bikes, saw that and thought, ah, oh, we could use that to try and get change in cities for for cycling. Build a platform, build a profile, engage with all the stakeholders, and see where it takes us. Uh, and there were now over a hundred bicycle mayors um, worldwide. It's really important to say that they're. Um, largely uh, independent of government that is different in some places but they're largely independent of um, the, the local council um, however to, to be successful you have to build a very strong relationship with, with the local authority um, which I you know I have done it I wouldn't get anywhere with that without it um, and, and the way people go about that is done in in various different ways um, I think it's new and, and, and an innovative form of local advocacy um, and uh, I think it's it's really helped accelerate um, what Coventry has uh, been um, been doing. I largely put it down to kind of this process to work with advocates and basically I'm here to support the council when they're being bold um, and I provide them the, with the political air cover that they need to make the right decisions for the, for the long term so I can come out in public like it says on the right and, and back something or I can you know take the flack uh, and help them make their lives uh, easier um, and there are lots of people that, that hand, having sort of been you know motivated by seeing this are willing to do that too and I think that's one of the brilliant things about um, the potential of this campaign group is that uh, you know there'll be lots of people that are, are willing to provide support to those elected officials and try and make it um, you know make it easy for them to make those bold decisions there is a mutual understanding though, it goes both ways, that I'll hold politicians to account when it doesn't go well. Um, and I think that the, the, the kind of carrot and stick approach is fairly successful um, here. I can therefore focus my efforts on communication, selling the benefits um, and working with all across the in, all different interest groups. Um, getting early data is really important, it's sort of helping them. Um, you know, I've been helping design schemes from a concept stage uh, as well with the council now that I've earned their, their trust. So um, this process can work, um, you know, really nicely. And just one example, um, I say just one example, like there are hundreds of examples. There are not. We are not building hundreds of miles of cycleways in Coventry, but we are building a couple. Um, so this is the Cowden Cycleway, which is practically finished. Um, really nice, high quality, segregated two-way uh, cycleway, um, which goes to an area of, of uh, very poor air quality. Uh, and there's also a longer sort of five mile cycle route that's just practically been signed off now for about five or six million pounds that funding is secured for and will happen to the same high quality design standards. The council's also looking at things like low traffic neighborhoods. Uh, I've arranged for them to visit Waltham Forest in London um, to go and explore uh, what's happened there. Um, a nice little tie-in is um, nothing to do with cycling campaigning, but John Kemp Starley, who I mentioned, invented the modern safety bicycle, was born in Walthamstow. He moved to Coventry. So it's a, it's a really nice link. And, and sometimes they're just the things that are needed to get the conversation going. I wanted to talk a little bit today um, on uh, what I 
um, think can be the biggest time sap of any campaign group. Um, and that is what I, I know you are um, sort of joining forces as a kind of livable streets group, which I think is really sensible and, and, and modern, but um, ultimately change is hard. Um, so you, you, you will come up against resistance to that change. And I spent quite a lot of time trying to build a communication strategy to deal with that, um, both in my day job, but also through the, the bicycle mayor stuff. I think good campaigns should always focus with who who matters, um, and and we have a, a kind of varying scale here on the the, the uh, left of str you know strongly disagree of of um, uh, stop trying to control us by closing our roads etc. Um, you, you'll have seen plenty of stuff about the low traffic neighbourhoods uh, happening in London and elsewhere, and on the right you've got um, you know the kind of one less car movement. This could be, you know, the London cycling campaign or any of those of which I'm a member of. But really, those people don't matter um, to, to getting change. They are already uh, convinced you are not changing their mind, whichever way that, that is. The middle is the, the, the most important to people. Uh, the lady on the right is uh, essentially someone who started cycling during the first lockdown. She's on a higher bike. She is not interested in any sort of culture war. She just thinks, ah, quite like cycling it's quite nice I'd be, able, I'd be able to do that more and we think that's you know the interest of the concern the vast majority of the the population ultimately um that would like to do this stuff if it was made safe the guy on the left is um well, he's actually a meme he's called hide the pain harold um but uh in this context i see him as a city councillor uh he's somebody who says yeah yeah i support active travel yeah active travel's great yeah yeah no definitely on that Oh, that act of travel. Oh, no, wait a minute. Uh, that, that, on that road. Uh, so he's vaguely happy that he's been given some money by central government to do something, but then petrified that, that his core voter is going to lose their mind over that. And, and generally, they're not, you know, they're not bad people. They're not even people who are against active travel. They're just worried about what's in front of them. Politicians often have a thousand fires to put out at any time, and they're going to they're gonna focus on the hundred that are going to burn them first. So it's about going on the agenda and helping them um, navigate that. So they're the two types um, of people that, that really matter. And um, being a, a campaigner for me, certainly, I was quite lonely at start. And, and you know, I try and remember that nothing worthwhile is, is ever really uh, easy. Um, and some, some kind of interesting examples of this. On the top left is um, uh, my reference of sewers. Basically, London would have had sewers between 75 and 100 years earlier than they did. Um, if it wasn't for the vast lobbying that happened from people who didn't like change and ultimately the industry of uh, night soil men who used to take out people's human waste in the evenings. Um, so that amazingly, we managed to, to avoid sewers for longer than we should have. And all the people that died because of cholera and, and other horrible diseases um, because of that vast lobbying effort. Same with smoking ban. You know, that was really split for a long time. Can you imagine going in a pub now? that had smoke in it it would be nuts to think of that the bottom one is the bottom graph is bus lanes in london so you saw that you know i think we're about the 1970s now for bike lanes you know bike bus lanes got put in some got taken out then there was a period of inaction and then you couldn't hold good policy back policy you know this stuff helps people and you can't avoid it um and that's what i think active travel is and you should always remember, I always remember that the elections locally can be won and lost by the frequency of our wheelie bin deliverers. So we need to remember that, that this is not uh, always a rational conversation. Uh, and sometimes it's about cutting through the noise or actually realizing that, that it doesn't actually matter and you should focus on what does. Um, so, uh, you know, it's often be phrased as bike clash, but it's a, you know, it's a continual fight. Anywhere that's got successful bike infrastructure has gone through it. New York, you know, everything, the bike lane cancer, all of this stuff will, will happen the more successful you are. It never used to happen here because we never used so many cycle lanes. Um, but now we're actually getting cycle infrastructure built. We're getting all the same cliched stuff and the playbook is the same every single time. Uh, in England, we've got, um, you know, this ridiculous headline on the left-hand side. It's, 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 it's horribly ridiculous. Green deputy leader of Brighton Council is knocked off her bike by a van while riding along hated lockdown cycle lanes she voted for. So you can see the really, um, the, the, just the absolutely ridiculous nature of some of this stuff. Um, and it seems to have um, appealed to many people called Nigel, 
who have found this kind of cultural war as someone that they want, whether Nigel Havers or Nigel Farage, um, they, these have been things that they've been fighting for. Um, and it, it happens, it's just a distraction from really what matters. Um, you've seen low traffic neighbor stuff, neighbor, neighborhood stuff in, in London, with stuff getting vandalized and stuff. It happens. It happened in Amsterdam in the 1970s. They ripped down the barriers and the car drivers went through it. If you are successful, it will happen. It will be demoralizing, but you, you, you can't spend too much time worrying about it. Um, so I think I, I often look at, when I'm looking at this kind of change is hard scenario, is what do you want to achieve? What will work best for the majority of your community? It's rarely about cycling or about active travel. It's often about much wider, deep ingrained issues that you can get the neighborhood behind. Understanding the goals of other local groups um, and also making it clear, like we're, we're as, uh, certainly as cycling advocates, we're often, you know, get sort of bogged down with talking about LTN 120 and, and road curvature. Uh, things like that. None of that stuff matters to to anybody uh, who is sort of vaguely normal who just wants to go about uh, about their life. So I often look at you know what's the vision, who do you need to help to get it to happen, and I think that's great in any area. Looking at who do we need to influence and how do we make it happen, relationship mapping. So going, how do I get to these people? What do they like? What don't they like? What are their concerns? And again, it won't be about cycling. It will be about road safety you know one of one of the local councillors in Coventry she I've never seen her ever ride a bike I don't think she would ever ride a bike but her tragically and I only found this out you know six months after doing it tragically her her niece was was killed in a road traffic collision by a speeding driver and and that became her main focus for change um and and most of the stuff comes from lower speeds but we also know that lower speeds built also reduce the road danger but build better communities so it's about understanding what people's individual needs and background and experiences are and then doing the engagement plan to build that change. A lot of people talk about work, the unwilling people who don't want stuff, just, just sort of ignore them. But, you know, you'll know which councillors or which people, you know, which local paper just don't care or won't ever change their mind. Move on because it's about finding the, the actually genuinely willing people. There are very few unwilling people, but if there are, they're not worth your, your time. When I look at relationship mapping, I look at how do we find that common ground, say looking beneath the surface, saying it's really about cycling. How can active travel help solve their challenges? Um, who can help you get stuff done? And also importantly in a council, what happens if that person leaves? So making sure that as a campaign group, getting you know relationship mapping of several people, both officers and council councillor levels, um, so that you can start to, to, to work together. Um, the majority of people are undecided really they're not again um i think it was nick clegg who said that most people just don't want to be bothered um every four years they might vote if they have to but just for the rest of it can you leave them alone um so it's about understanding what are the problems in the local community that does motivate people you know is it speeding is it antisocial behavior what can active travel measures or better public realm do to support i think engaging and not imposing is really important building genuine community discussion um and and that genuine engagement can then lead to local ward councillors championing ideas if they understand them and if they understand some of the concerns um data is super important and i think everyone messed up ultimately i've not seen anyone do a good job with the emergency active travel stuff they didn't have baseline data they didn't know whether more people were cycling or walking like how can you build schemes like that so we, we've learned the hard way ultimately i think every council uh, has learned the hard way um, but people are willing to fight for stuff if they've got good data to support good policy um, and we didn't we know that it, it will work but um, we, we couldn't quite quite prove it I also away from this I just trust people that they know what good looks like um, when you show it them often it's what we have shown them if I'm honest has been water-filled barriers and bright white and red or, or, or cones that have fallen over um, or paint on the road. Um, but when you start to boil it down, you know, I, I go to centre parks occasionally, I haven't been for a while, but um, I went to centre parks and, and effectively it's a low traffic neighbourhood. It's got a, a 10 mile an hour speed limit. Access is retained for people who really need it and deliveries. It's safe enough to let your children cycle, scoot, walk. It's practically even a 15 minute city to kind of talk on sort of modern trends with everything that you need in, in a close proximity. There's spaces to stop and sit, and they've got an equitable transport system. And no one sort of 
yeah, if people go to people go to the box, go, oh, I bloody love that. That was great. Oh, I wish I could have that. People know what it's what it looks like and when it's good, you know, people will um respond well. No one ever comes back from holiday in Amsterdam and said, Oh yeah, I had a really nice time in Amsterdam, but there's too many cars. I just wish there were more cars or, or whatever it would be. No one no one says that. Um people again know what good looks like. And a lot of people said during lockdown they could hear the birds sing. And you can notice that when you go to a city that's, you know, cities aren't noisy. It's 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 ultimately motor vehicles that that are uh, are noisy. You have to start in a sensible way. So I think uh, I look at every movement when I was studying this of, of, of cycling has has, um, has led from doing it for for one day a year, um, and then it became one day a month, and then it became one day a week, and then people thought, well, why can't we just have this all the time? Um, and that was. Um, you know that that's been really successful in Amsterdam, in New York, in Bogota, in London, um, and and I think it's a really good way to show people try before they buy in a really high quality uh, environment. Finally, you know I think there's data out there, data response to some people. We through the Bikers Best campaign created this study with um, people in in, in Britain um, that showed that for every uh, one person against measures to enable cycling, there were six and a half in favour. And I know a lot of local councillors use that to kind of give themselves the, the the boldness to cut through the noise because ultimately they would get 50 angry emails, but you're never going to hear from the 500 people that are sort of going, oh, this is nice, isn't it? Because what, you know, before I did any of this, I, the only time I ever spoke to the council was when I needed a new bin. That was the only time I ever spoke to the council. And most of them people don't. Why would you write to your local councillor? It's, it's, it's something that most people just don't do. So many unwilling people are actually willing in disguise once you find the rationale. Um, use the carrot, funding is that. Um, the stick you have as campaigners is media scrutiny. I think keeping the pressure on, I think can be really important. And focus on energy when you make, when you make change, when you can make change. Um, so yeah, really focus on the willing um, because there's enough of them out there to, to make change. And thank you. That's great, Adam. Thank you. Um, I think that's that's an incredible body of work, just in terms of mapping um, everything from beginning to trying to get projects through and understanding the mindset. You know, uh, and I think that is it's one of the most difficult things, um, certainly from cycle campaigning and all the rest of it, in terms of trying to bring people along and and to make that case. And um, uh, interestingly, I actually think that there's a bit of a twinning uh, between Belfast and Coventry as well to be going on to do with cycling. Um, everybody seems to throw claims around about uh, the, the birthplace of the bicycle and we have a claim linked to yourself as well um i think you mentioned about uh, john camp starty uh inventing the the rover safety bicycle in 1885 i think it was his uncle uh john starty is that right james uh, james, james starty who uh was responsible for the penny farthing uh and and a generation before and and obviously by um the 1880s the penny farthing was uh certainly in terms of racing as well but was 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 ubiquitous uh and 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 in a sense was limiting the the the, the possibility of the bicycle to be the tool that it was um and along came the safety bicycle but i think i've seen a video of you actually uh on a on a on a maybe not an original i think from from a couple of generations on from from one of the the original ones uh that had back in the 1880s um hard rubber tires yeah no no it was from 1887 it's yeah, the, uh -huh. yeah the one that uh, i made that that's when belfast comes in <laughs> because we have john boyd dunlop uh who took that idea of the safety bicycle uh and then applied his not invention because there was a bit of a paint issue there but uh the pneumatic tire to yeah. the safety bicycle and in belfast in 1889 uh racer willie hume um, took on a field uh, of penny farthing bicycles uh, at a meet on his safety bicycle with pneumatic tires blew the field away in several races demonstrating the you know yeah. uh, both the safety bicycle and the pneumatic tire uh, in terms of its its uh um utility and i think that everything went on from there so i think we'll we'll have to have a a joint uh celebration about it at some stage so sure. um but uh no listen that that's great i think we, we, um a question too there but i think um somebody had asked about just in terms of the, the is there like a, a streets or active travel or cycling campaign uh distinct in, in coventry as well and, and how do you as the bicycle mayor kind of um uh 
you know, match in with that and, and work with that. And I think as well, just from my point of view, I mean, how, how do you feel? It could be very frustrating as somebody who's working in, in cycling campaigning and things don't really move along. I mean, are you are you confident? Are you optimistic for the future in Coventry about getting plans through and getting networks through? How, how is it mm. at the moment? Yeah, so so in terms of are there campaign groups, that was one of the uh, motivations for, for doing this and that, that there, there wasn't really, and, and I felt it needed a sort of a, a new and innovative style of, of campaigning. If I'm honest, you know, the, there are um, a couple of cycle campaigners in commentary, but, you know, I'm talking literally a couple. Um, they are great guys and they've done some brilliant work. Um, but I, I sense coming into this that they, they'd sort of just got frustrated with, 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 with uh, which is totally understandable. Where, you know, uh, I think the way of working, new way of working has been beneficial to campaigning, but I'm also under no illusions that I started doing this a month before uh, the, the a global pandemic, uh, which, you know, so I'd like to take all the credit for the stuff moving along, but, but really, you know, this has been, um, this has been the way uh, now and has been a, a greater funding and impetus to, to, to do that. I made the mistake ultimately and I think you guys are way ahead of me here um, in thinking it was about cycling so you know I started and thought well it's just sort of just me really there's a few people that we could write some letters or something but then I started talking to people and listening to their problems and listening to things that they were interested in it and it all fitted in so there's a very large Green New Deal group um, you know there's uh, there's a kind of air quality group in Coventry and Warwickshire there's obviously various different political parties that have members. So engaging with them opened it up um, to, to many more people um, and it became, um, you know, it became more normal. So I think uh, this is one way of doing things. Um, it's not the way by any means and, and it's got to work the way where you are and um, a, a more conventional campaign might be the better um, option. Um, but we didn't, yeah, we didn't have a campaign group. So we needed some way to get it on the agenda uh, in Coventry. That's great, thank you. Um, no, that that that's super, and I think it's something that um, it's it's in the 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 comments there as well. Just uh, I think we have a uh, a Dublin cycle, uh, Dublin bicycle mayor, and a yes. junior bicycle mayor in Dublin as well. So, um, and I guess you know uh, it's one of those things that um, with the audience or people who want to kind of get involved with uh, streets for all and I, it's certainly one of those things that we could be looking at and taking the example of Adam and, and others as well. Um, and, you know, Belfast, Derry, Menaskillen, who knows, we could have bicycle mares popping up uh, along the way. It's certainly, um, it's certainly one way of focusing minds, I guess, uh, locally. So Adam, really, thank you so much for, for your, your presentation. That's, that's been great. Um, and maybe there's a couple more questions there in, in the chat you might want to go back to directly, but yep. we'll, we'll, we'll crack on uh, trying to keep the time anyway tonight. So uh, that, that's brilliant. Our, our final speaker then uh, for the evening is uh, Damien Otuma. Um, so Damien is the National Cycling Coordinator with uh, Cyclist IE and Antasca. Um, Antasca is the, the National Trust for Ireland. Um, his main focus is in supporting Cyclist.ie uh, and its 25 plus member groups uh, in collaborating effectively and advancing Cyclist.ie's new strategy. Um, he's worked in the mobility space for over 20 years and completed his doctoral research uh, exploring transitions in mobility systems in, in 2015 in, in Trinity in Dublin. Uh, he was a board member for the European Cyclist Federation from 2016 to 2021, and he's currently on the board of Transport Infrastructure Ireland. Um, over to you, Damien. Um, Jonathan, thanks a million for the introduction, and thanks a million for the, the previous speakers. Um, it's a privilege to follow them. I learned, learned loads by listening to them. Uh, maybe just to, to kick off, Dublin obviously has a claim in the, um, the history of um, the development of the bicycle with John, John Dunlop's first pneumatic bike tower factory on St. Stephen Street, just behind Dublin Castle. I see Mairead Forsyth mentioned it in the chat there. So you know, very important, the links between Coventry and Belfast and Dublin. Um, so look, I just want, to, um, just want to give an overview of what we have been doing in cyclist.e over the last uh, 10 years or so. And um, roughly want to cover, cover three things in my short presentation. Um, I want to give a short, a short overview of the, uh, the development of cycle campaigning 
uh, in the Republic in the last, really in the last 30, 40 years, and really then talk a little bit about what, what, what the main things we have been focusing on and what our main successes have been. And then finally make a few suggestions and perhaps even recommendations about, you know, may, maybe some of those initiatives could be, could be helpful for you uh, in your own campaigning work. Um, so as Adam, and I think some of your other speakers said, um, this, th this image here, it, it was produced by Fietz's Bond, uh, the Dutch Cyclist Union in 1979. And uh, I think it's a brilliant image. It's been copied in different cities since, and it really shows the inequitable way that street space has been has been has been really um, has been used over the decades, and I just think this this image showed brilliantly, you know, all of the different ways you can use space and the way it's used in the uh, in the top corner there with all the cars. That that's not the way to go. And I actually I have a bit of a story about this. And I sent away for this poster back in in the early '90s when I first started getting involved in cycling campaigning. And I sent away to the Netherlands for it. And um, when it arrived at my home, the, the uh, poster had been ripped open, presumably by Irish customs, thinking it was some interesting contraband. And it was simply this, this um, very strong poster showing how, how cities, uh, how streets could be used. So back in, really back in Ireland in the 1970s, there was uh, the first, really the start of psychic campaigning was when, when a voluntary services international uh, produced a report um, uh, about cycling in Dublin and, and Dr. Mike McKillen, who's been very involved in, in cyclist.e over the years, he was involved at that time. And it was really the first attempt to inscribe cycling into transport thinking at the time. And then in the 1980s in Dublin, there were efforts by the Dublin Corporation, as it was called, to build inner highway schemes, you know, very much oversized car dominated routes through the heart of George and Dublin. And, um, you know, there were further efforts in the 1980s with Carmen C. to Hederman. And then it was really only, it, it was really in the early 90s then that the Dublin cycling campaign um, got going. And this is an image from um, early on in the campaign, in the campaigning work. And it was, you know, it was street protests, it was being, it, it was really, it was, it was being, being on the streets to, um, to, to remind everyone that the bicycle was a legitimate part of transport. And the bicycle had been written out of formal transportation policy really over the previous 50 or 60 years and the gentleman there with the, with the berry who, who has quite an important position now as the minister for for, for transport and with um, some other other members there so the dublin cycling campaign kicked off in 1993 and at the time there was really there was a horrific number of fatalities involving heavy goods vehicles at the time so a lot of the campaigning work was a reaction to that and there was also a window of opportunity opening up and that the paradigm um, of around car centric planning was beginning to change in cities. Certainly the rhetoric was beginning to change, the policy was beginning to change, but it was another few decades before the investment, uh, the investment decisions actually began to change and things began to change in the ground. Then soon afterwards, uh, Go Away Cycling Campaign emerged, uh, also fighting for better conditions in Go Away. Uh, Cork Cycling Campaign, came along at around the same time. And then very soon afterwards, there were a few more groups, Waterford Cycling Campaign, Limerick, Maynooth, Skerries, and those seven groups in 2008 uh, came together to form uh, Cyclist.ie, the National Federation, with uh, Dr. Mike McKillen uh, as the first, uh, first chairperson. So Cyclist.ie, we plugged into the European Cyclist Federation, which itself is the overarching uh, organization for cycling advocacy in Europe. And the beauty about plugging into the European Cyclist Federation was that we are able to kind of systematically exchange our experiences, our knowledge with groups all around Europe, maybe around 80 different groups in Europe. And we've been very much uh, plugged into the ECF since then. Uh, we always head to their uh, annual general meeting and they're just good experiences. And one of, one of the themes running through my presentation is that cycling campaigning, it's a social activity. You're meeting people, you're learning, you're developing friendships. And it's unfortunately, it's not something that, that you do for a year and then your job is done. It's, a, it's an ongoing process. And I'd urge, uh, I'd, I'd, urge, I'd urge the group in the North to plug into the ECF in, in some way as well. Strategic partnerships have been really important. Um, in 2013, on Tashka, uh, in 2013, Cyclist Study, we um, 
created the position of National Cycling Coordinator, a position shared with Antashka, with whom we have a strategic partnership. Strategic partnership. Antashka is the National Trust for Ireland. It has a strong sustainability dimension running through it, and it's looking at buildings, it's looking at conservation, biodiversity, climate, and Cycling Ireland. We've had a strategic partnership with them for, for a number of years as well, primarily looking at normalizing cycling, making it safer, and, and so forth. Um, we've had a good bit of contact over the years with uh, what used to be the Northern Ireland Cycling Initiative. This is the late Tom McClelland and his wife, Catherine and Tom, did fabulous work um, in the North around, you know, just trying to push the, the cycling agenda. And it was a huge loss when, when he died prematurely a few years ago, but I, I, still, th I still think about it. Um, Cyclist.e now, there's, we, we've around 28 groups in our network, and then there are additional groups popping up all of the time. This isn't the latest map, this is the screenshot um, I had to hand, but we've, we've a great number of groups in the network now, and even more groups when you put up the map uh, in duplicate. Um, one of the big developments we have made in the last, really the last year, is um, it's nurturing cycling advocacy in smaller rural communities, smaller towns and villages, and uh, I said initially that most of the cycling campaigning was in, in our cities and towns, but really in the last year, we've had fabulous groups working in Leitrim, Atlanta-Kilty, um, Kilkenny, um, Sligo, and loads of towns. And um, I'd, I'd, I'd urge everyone to check out our document, A Vision for Cycling in Rural Ireland. And it's been, it's a brilliant document, I think. And it really, you know, it, it, it kind of put, the stress is on what needs to happen in rural Ireland to get, people walking, cycling, because sometimes the image, the image we're used in cycling advocacy, it is very uh, city focused, although I was delighted to see so many, so many rural images used by Julia in her, in her presentation. And again, lower speed limits has been a huge part of our campaigning, uh, making having 30 kilometers per hour the default uh, speed limit in built up areas and really normalizing cycling to school for, uh, for younger, for, you know, for, for the younger, the younger crew. And um, we've there's been some great campaigns around this, and I'd do I do advise check out our website for more information on this. Then just to get to the heart of what I want to talk about, you know, what are our main campaigning focuses and successes? And um, when when um, Cyclist Study formed in 2008, at the time the Department of Transport was putting together a national cycle policy framework, and this was the ideal time for the then separate cycle campaign groups to get together. You know, to avoid duplication of efforts, to combine our expertises, to make sure we weren't missing out something crucial. And we put a huge effort into informing this, this policy, which I think itself, you know, acted as a stimulus to advance a lot of different cycling projects. Bike Week came out of it. And, the, you know, we highlighted the different legislative proposals, the different le legislative interventions that needed to happen. Um, the document spoke about, you know, the, the need for, you know, good planning, uh, permeability, high quality cycle infrastructure, investments. So I think it, it did move the debate along. Uh, when it was published, it came just before the financial crash in the Republic. So a lot of the schemes, everything kind of came to a standstill for a few years after the financial crash. But then I think things moved on in the last, the last number of years again. So a lot of our work as campaigner is trying to influence, trying to shape policy. And at the moment, there's a few major uh, policy initiatives and documents which we're trying to influence. The Sustainable Mobility Policy, which will be published later this year. The Climate Action Plan which is due to come out next month. Uh, National Investment Framework for Transport in Ireland. There's a Strategic Rail Review, which is an all-island uh, review process coming up. So there's a whole number of different initiatives that we're looking to influence. So a lot of our work, our bread and butter work as campaigners is doing that. The big one is funding. And for a long time after um, some really good investigative work by, by some of our, our core members, we, we realized that maybe one or maybe maximum 2% of the, of the uh, transport budget, annual transport budget was being spent on walking and cycling. And we know from the 2016 United Nations Environment Programme report that 20% uh, needs to be spent on walking and cycling in order to really change the, change the picture. So this has been one of our main campaigns for the last few years. And one of our main successes in that, in the programme for government published last year, um, the government committed to spend 
20% of the transport budget on walking and cycling, which corresponds to 360 million per annum, or around 1.8 billion over the five-year um, period of government. So this has been a huge success. Um, you know, having got the money, the next stages is it being spent properly on good schemes, on networks, coherent networks, uh, high quality facilities. So this is um, the Dublin Cycle Network Plan. And a lot of our work as campaigners is, you know, making sure this happens in every single town and city, not, ju not just the capital. Legislative change is a big part of our work is, um, is campaigning for, you know, different legislative interventions to make cycling easier and safer and normal. We very much supported the work of Phil Skelton uh, based in Wexford and his Staying Alive at 1.5 campaign. And again, we did, we, did, uh, we, did, we did a legislative victory in getting a new regulation introduced. Um, we also repealed the use of the mandatory use statutory instrument, which, which was requiring cyclists to use sometimes dreadful cycle facilities. And that took, that took around 10 years to, to repeal that. So that was a huge amount of work. Um, I think in the last few years, there's been an increased focus on the, the imbalance in the, the demographic profile of cyclists on the street. And there's been, there's been a huge drop off in the number of women cycling and girls in particular. And you can see when I was in school in the 1980s, there was nearly 20,000 uh, girls cycling to school. And by 2016, that had dropped to just 694. So one of our big focuses campaigning wise is trying to renormalize cycling for, for uh, people of all ages and abilities for, for, for women, um, you know, bringing uh, people with disabilities and really, really the whole inclusive agenda has, has, has moved into, into our work in, in a big way. Uh, tied in with that, one of our current campaigns is around kissing the gates goodbye. I think everyone is familiar with kissing gates and they're, um, they're a bane of a cyclist with panniers on, but they're an even, they're an even worse um, uh, barrier for anyone with a cargo bike, a tandem, uh, someone, anyone carrying children on bikes, etc. So this is one of our campaigns. And maybe this is something we could, uh, we could work on, on an all island basis. Um, quickly, um, organizationally, as campaigners, we all prefer to be working on core campaigns, but there, there's a lot of work to actually getting a, getting a national organization working properly. Um, we've, we've, tw we've 28 groups in our, in our network now at the moment. That's them listed there. Uh, there's one or two uh, that, that have been added since then. Um, we have a really good executive committee. We have uh, 11 uh, elected members, members elected to our executive. We meet uh, once a month over Zoom. Um, we have a pretty good spread around the country. Um, still, we're still not up to 50-50 women, but it's improved in the last few years, and we have a good we have a good spread of ages. So I think we're we're improving diversity-wise, but I think it's something we're we're increasingly conscious of all the time. And um, we developed a strat we pub we developed a strategy and adopted it in December, and um, they're the main they're the main aims there. Um, you know, it's all about developing the community, changing the conversation around cycling. Um, ensuring public policy embraces cycling, it's getting the new legislation in, it's funding, it's high quality routes, and I can circulate. Uh, we'll have the public version of the strategy up, up on our website soon, and happy to um, you know happy to share share these documents with uh, with yourselves. Um, we try to divvy out our work. There's a huge amount happening. We're trying to divide out the work in a logical way. Um, this slide here shows really four of the main ways that we try to create change. It's engagement with politicians, engagement with officials, um, it's engaging on consultations, the public consultations. Uh, we do a lot of research and our different, we have different members who look after these areas. And then the, the more internal sides of running an organization, you know, there, there's finance and funding, there's membership, uh, there's developing tools so we can share our knowledge in the organization. Um, there's how we communicate with the outside world through social media, press releases, media interviews, and other organizational stuff. So, so there's a lot to pull together and keep the organization going. And um, we do lots of interviews. That's from, um, that's from prime time last year when, when one of us on it. So look, to come to, I'm conscious of the time. So just to come to the end of the presentation, um, I've tried to capture here in a couple of bullet points what, what I think the main, the main uh, takeaways are. So look, first of all, hopefully, um, I think this is a lovely event tonight, and I hope we can use this launch as a springboard to bring, you know, to bring more people into the mix, um, more, more groups, you know, more energy to move everything along. 
Um, what we did ahead of the uh, general election last year was really to try and distill all of our all of our asks and demands into ten points. And some of those might be might be you know of interest interest to yourselves might be useful. Um, the third one, organisationally, if you've half a dozen groups um, chipping in and supporting uh, the different aims, there's a little bit of thinking to be done around how you you know how you organise yourselves, how how committees form, how you make decisions, who's the chairperson. There's a, unfortunately there's a certain amount of organisational stuff in any any um, any movement, and it's just something you need to to deal with. Um, I mentioned the European Cyclist Federation earlier on in the talk. Um, there's, some, there's no point reinventing the wheel, to use that, that uh, cliche. There's loads of good information out there, research, so I'd strongly recommend you plug into the European Cyclist Federation. And the last point, it's a long, hard journey. It can be a long journey to, to create change, and um, I just think it's really important to have fun along the way. Uh, you make great friends through cycle campaigning, and um, I'd urge everyone to get involved. So I think that's it. And um, that slide there was sent to me just before the, um, the start of the session by Siobhan McNamara on the Cycling Study Executive. And it was an image from one of our, our uh, Bike Week events um, there just, just last week. And I think it, it illustrates the, the, the diversity of people who are beginning to get on bikes in, in, in this case in Dublin, once you provide the infrastructure, this is along the Grand Canal. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks a million. And happy to answer any questions. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Damien. Um, yeah, I mean, the breadth of the work is incredible. Um, and and um, I think that's what I'm always struck by whenever over the years I've I've had engagement with cyclist.ie. Um, I've always been incredibly impressed by that localism, that that idea of people from the ground in small towns and villages that I guess I, I've kind of dreamed of, of having here and I think it's it's definitely something that we need to look at in terms of, of, of inspiring and engaging people to take ownership of their place and, and, and space and, and see that 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 type of change is possible and um, it's not just about Belfast it's not just about Derry it's not just about the places that um, have big mega plans it can be about those other places too and that is just as important um, and and yeah the couple of trips I've had down as well to, to meet up with the guys and, and um, certainly something I'm, I'm looking forward to and I think we all are that idea of, of meeting up in person and and maybe going for a pint afterwards you know uh, is really really important too and um, I mean just just from my point of view um, one of the things that over the years we've had certain frustrations here is trying to get across to politicians and uh, decision makers and government about that idea of, of truly committing. Um, I mean, we have plans here. We have strategies coming out the years. We have a Belfast Bicycle Network plan. We've had it in consultation for four years. Um, there's a sense of trying to get on with it. And part of that is, is about committing the money, um, not just the will, but yeah. But yeah. putting it down, I mean, some of the examples I've seen in the last few days about Oslo, I think um, putting somewhere, and I'll, I'll be careful with my figures here, but somewhere up to 95 euro per head of population into, you know, cycling. I think Ireland with the 360 million, that working out somewhere around 75 euro per head of population per year. Um, you know, the, the, the one that we've used over the years has been the Netherlands, you know, in around the kind of 30 or, or slightly more. Um, per head of population per year. And I think just as a comparison point, Northern Ireland, um, this year we've had the most amount in, in decades, but that's six, six euro per head of population. Typically it's been down at about two euro for, for, yeah. for comparison purposes. So we, we kind of look enviously uh, to the outside and just across the border and other places too. Yeah. How, how transformative is that amount of money? I mean, is it about getting the rubber to the road? Um, are you really seeing the outcome from it? Are the plans coming along that you're really seeing that tangible benefit? You know, is 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 it is it is it going the way that you think it it has done with that big announcement? Yeah, that's the that's that is the question. Our main job now is to make sure that the 360 million to be spent per annum on walking and cycling is actually spent on really good schemes, you know, schemes that form critical parts of the network, schemes that are of a sufficiently high quality, schemes which meet or ideally surpass what's in the uh, design manual for urban roads and streets or the national cycle manual. And, um, you know, sometimes it can be it can be difficult to find out. Part, part of our job as campaigners is to dig into 
digging into what the um, funding applications were put into the Department of Transport actually were that are being funded. And it's a work in progress, Jonathan. So um, it's probably realistically, it's probably going to be a mixed bag initially. You know, we are working for higher design standards, you know, that, that are mandatory, that engineers actually need to follow because at the moment, um, the National Cycle Manual, they're really guidelines. And, you know, we've been disappointed with the quality of a lot of schemes over the years, and it's enormously frustrating to see money. Uh, often my money is spent quickly, it's spent poorly. And we're just, we, we're, our next job is to just keep an eye on every single one of the 31 uh, local authorities in Ireland to make sure that the money is being spent uh, properly. And that requires, you know, connecting with our local groups who in turn connect in, with, connect in with the councils through, you know, the different committees, through relationships with the engineers and so forth. So um, we, we'll have a better picture of how the money is being spent, um, I think, you know, maybe later in the year, early next year. Yeah, well, I think it's definitely a challenge to us anyway to, to kind of plug in with what you guys are doing. And and I know I think the, the Northwest Greenway group have been involved too. And, you know, that if we do have, if we manage to seed some groups in, in different areas um, to try and utilize the tools that, that cyclist.ie have there. Um, Agustina, I think you have a quick question there for mm. Jimmy, yeah? Uh, no, I, I actually have a, a comment on a question that was on the... On the on the list there about density is that okay? Sure, sure. If I bring it in. Um, so it's it's just about density, and I think Julia touched on that. The question comes from Rory O'Neill about housing policy uh, being part of this, and I, I think this is something that is very much part of what I'm teaching and work that a group of us has been doing for the Department of, for Communities in in Belfast um, and in in general for Northern Ireland. Is the idea that you can actually familiarize yourself with how good density can be. And it's very difficult to convince that, convince people of that, but it's a very long game and it has to come together with mobility. It can't, they can't be isolated things, housing and mobility. And that's why getting the Department for Communities together with the Department for Infrastructure. And I think someone else mentioned the crossing of departments is something that I think we have to keep really at the top of our agenda in in the campaign that it's not an isolated thing about just moving around but also about allowing people to live a little bit closer together to make that moving less complicated and far that's great yeah thank you and i, I know we we have very particular challenges especially in belfast with that too um but uh, no listen that's great uh, and damien thank you so much for your presentation as well that that's great and i say really really shows the depth of the work and, that, and the tools and the resources and the knowledge built up over the years uh through cyclist.ie um so uh, conscious of time got a couple of minutes left might might go a minute or two over but um it's been it's been great to have everybody there tonight i think that the cyclist.ie guys are, are saying that we have uh typically what they'll do is they'll they'll open up uh the um we'll keep the webinar going afterwards so if there's a bit of networking or a bit of um chat to be had um we'll anybody who's left on the call we can we can all have a bit of uh chat afterwards so do do hang about if if you're interested uh, and i'll just kind of conclude with a few points of action I've, I've sent them as links through the chat if you want to go back up there but just to really um have a look at some of the things that are happening at the moment in terms of things that you can get involved in immediately um in uh northern ireland that would make a, a big difference so um and say everybody's done a great job here of getting the uh presentation up and i'm not going to do a very good job of it but I'll, I'll go with this for now anyway if you can see that and um basically uh the thing that was mentioned um by uh, earlier on was uh translink and the issue with the dublin road cycle lane um earlier on this week uh and uh the call or, or the lobbying that have been going on to get the pop-up cycle in and Dublin Road put in as part of the COVID strategy at the start of the last year um, removed. I was in a meeting earlier on today and they have now confirmed that they are supportive of retaining that cycleway. Um, and uh, I think they they were going to get a bus lane 
um, put in as part of that. So that has been a really good win in terms of the engagement that that story got through the BBC uh, and the pressure that the the amount of retweets, likes, comments, all the rest of it. So um, that was an example of really, really good um, people coming together and making a big difference there. So that's that's a, a big win and that's great. Um, in terms of things that you can be getting on with, um, I'll go through them quickly in chronological order. So consultations and things that you can be feeding into now. So there is a bustling uh, consultation um, closing tomorrow, um, adding bus lanes onto the Ballygown Road and Castle Ray Road corridor in Belfast. And um, that's with the Department for Infrastructure. And I know from being local in the area that there is significant opposition already um, starting to brew up about this um, bus lane. You can see from the streetscape there, it's a very wide road, uh, just from a very basic standpoint. I think that there shouldn't be an issue with that. But um, despite what's been going on between TransLink and all the rest of it, I think we should, uh, if possible, all roll in behind that call to extend the bus lane network in Belfast uh, to make a real difference for sustainable transport. There's also the um, lighting of the Cumber Greenway, um, which uh, is a consultation which is closing next Friday uh, at 5 p.m. And that is about making certainly anyway, possibly the urban sections, possibly the full length of the Cumber Greenway lit. Uh, it's a real issue for um, uh, access, for uh, the feeling of safety. Um, and certainly I know that it's, it's, it's not a, a particularly inviting place. Uh, when we get into the winter time after 5 p.m. when it's pitch dark and pitch black and I think that it, it would be a real step up then um, if, if we could match the excellent Conswater uh, Community Greenway which has lighting um, during the evening time so that's something else to get involved in and um, then there in terms of consultations in a couple of weeks time uh, Monday the 4th of October there is a consultation on the expansion of the glider, um, which is Belfast's rapid transit system um, going north and south of the city. Uh, we already have it east and west and into the Titanic quarter, but there is a proposal to run it now on one of either the Antrim Road or the Shore Road to the north, and then to the south of the city along possibly the Armo corridor and I think an extension to Queen's University. So again, that's something that you can get involved in and make a consultation response. Again, all of those links are in the chat. And then finally, um, just been announced by the Department for Infrastructure that there is now a, um, a reopening of the road safety grant scheme. So up to £10,000 is available for individuals, community groups um, working on road safety issues, um, hopefully slightly more ambitious than high visibility and um, a sign. Um, but uh, that's up to yourselves. If you have great ideas for road safety, um, there is potential funding available there. So again, go on and have a look on the Department for Infrastructure website um, to see what you can get involved with there. So apologies for the uh, presentation not, not being in the right format there. But again, Listen, thank you so much, guys, for um, for coming along tonight. Um, it's been great to see people. It's been great to kind of get involved. And hopefully um, you'll take something out of it. Um, I'd like to thank all the contributors tonight. So Agustina, Julia, Adam and Damien for their segments. And thanks to the guys at cycles.ie for providing the platform for the webinar tonight. And uh, Connor being in the background there for holding our hands. Thank you uh, through this first attempt. Um, and to say we're going to keep the channel open for a while so if you're in and want to have a wee chat we'll be there um i think um raid for uh had suggested to open beer wine tea and crisps if you have them not necessarily in that order uh, but we'll, we'll see how it goes uh so i hope you've enjoyed the event um taking some insight into potential action that could be taken in your area uh, and that you might feel it's worth getting involved in Streets for All and I in some way um, as we, we move forward. So thank you very much and, and good night. Okay, great, Jonathan. So I'm going to stop the recording now and then I'm going to then, well, I'll stop first. Right, stop.